Welcome back everyone. Today on the Joseph Carlson Show, the stock market started off green, moved to the red after Jerome Powell said that he is ready to raise rates to get inflation all the way back down to 2%. Should this be a surprise? I don't think so. We have the case of Nvidia, a company that is defying all odds. It's defying gravity. Nvidia is defying the laws of physics. So we're going to be looking at the valuation of Nvidia, at the growth rates, and seeing if this company is the most overvalued company in the world, or if it's one of the best buys in the market. Now we have Amazon trying to sneak their way into payments, fighting against Apple and Google, but Amazon's ambitions are much greater than Apple and Google. Subway Sandwich is being sold to the firm Rorick Capital, which is another private food company. We'll be going over the details of this transaction. Disney's trading nearly at a 10 year low, a low all the way back to 2013. We're going to be looking at whether or not Disney shareholders should continue to hold the stock or move on. And then finally, it's Friday, which you know what that means. We look to TikTok to get the best advice on investing and life in general. And we found something special here. This individual has the ability to make one day into four. What I've done now is I have changed a manipulated time. I now get 21 days a week. He has manipulated time. He gets 21 days a week. We're going to see how he was able to do this. Obviously, we have a lot to get to. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Now, let's go ahead and start off with a portfolio update. This is the passive income account, which is my primary investment. This is by far my biggest sum of capital, my largest portfolio. I have no huge stash of money sitting somewhere else. So this isn't for show. This isn't to amuse others. This is my real investing. And the experiment that we're doing here is being transparent about where I'm putting my money. This is something that a lot of other big investors do. They file 13 F filings. I basically do the same thing, but I do it on a more routine basis. Instead of doing it once every three months, I do it every single week. So you get to see an inside look into what I do in terms of buying and selling. Now with my portfolio, I've been focusing on companies that I think are monopolistic, highly entrenched. They're the market leaders in their industry. They typically have the largest market share. They're also companies that have immense pricing power. They have products that are usually necessary in economies and they're very difficult to compete with. The reason that I focus on these type of companies is because I consider them to be far more predictable. Out of all the characteristics I look for when scanning over companies to invest in, my number one question every single time, the first thing I look for is the predictability of the company. Meaning, can I look into the future and reasonably see how this company is going to turn out with a great deal of accuracy? Or is there a high chance that I could be wrong? If there's a high chance I could be wrong, I don't invest, no matter what the valuation is. So the reason that I invest in companies like this, as opposed to other ones that are at cheaper valuations, lower PE ratios, and higher free cash flow yields, is because these companies are more predictable. Now, because these companies are predictable, it also allows me to be concentrated. If you concentrate into companies that are unpredictable, you're taking on a tremendous amount of risk. But if you concentrate your portfolio into companies that are predictable, I don't think that's risky. Now in the news today, this just makes me laugh. This is the attitude of investors. Today we started off with a green market. And then Jerome Powell said something that instantly made the market go down around half a percent. Here's the line. This is exactly what Jerome Powell said to immediately drop the market half a percent. Quote, although inflation has moved down from its peak, a welcome development, it remains too high. We are prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intend to hold policy at a restrictive level until we are confident that inflation is moving sustainably down towards our objective. That was the scary thing that Jerome Powell said. The exact same thing that he's been saying for the past two years. And the exact same thing that anyone sane would expect him to say. That inflation is still too high because it's not at his target of 2%. And that they're prepared to raise rates further to lower inflation. That was it. If anybody believed that he was going to say anything different, then they must not be paying attention. Jerome Powell has been incredibly consistent this entire time. He will raise rates until inflation goes back down to 2%. There's nothing complicated about that. Jerome Powell has clearly communicated for the past year that the target rate is 2% and they're going to raise interest rates until inflation goes to 2%. That's it. There's nothing to figure out. There's nothing more for him to say. All this nonsense about paying attention to his every last sentence creates this ongoing roller coaster of a market that's not necessary. So to see the market react this way, for bond yields to go up, for the market to drop down after he reiterates something that he's been saying for the past year, I think is just silly. A way that you'll know 
that Jerome Powell is not looking at raising rates anymore, a clear indication of that is if inflation falls back to the target rate, then he won't need to raise rates anymore. Until that happens, he's going to raise rates more. Nothing about this is complicated. So just to be clear to every investor out there, no news was made today with Jerome Powell. He did not say anything remotely different than anything he's been saying for the past year. So all the drama and news ginned up from this event on CNBC and other news outlets, it's just trying to make something out of nothing. There was literally nothing revealing here. Now moving on, we have the story of one company that may be the most overvalued company in the market, or it may still be cheap. And determining that is very difficult. We're talking about Nvidia here. One thing that I wanted to look at was the media coverage that we're now getting for Nvidia. Investors are falling in love with this company head over heels over the past week because of its explosive outperformance in the numbers. The Wall Street Journal saying that Nvidia's AI surge is just getting started. It's just getting started. We have Barron's doing a breakdown of the math on Nvidia to surpass Apple as the most valuable company in the world. So we now have investors and the media really focusing on Nvidia. Every single analysis firm recently bumped up their price targets, many to price targets of $650 to $700 per share or more. The growth of this company is unreal. And I wanted to first look at a couple charts here to illustrate how silly the growth really is. So we're looking at Qualtrum here, which is software I developed to look at the visuals of a company because you can understand the fundamentals of a company better by looking at the visuals. When we look at the revenue of Nvidia, this is on a quarterly basis. This clearly illustrates how ridiculous the growth is. This last quarter of 13.51 billion, that is correct. This is really what it looks like. It looked like Nvidia's revenue was actually in decline year over year before this quarter. Then all of a sudden, it has a spike of doubling the revenue quarter over quarter. Year over year, the revenue doubled by 101%. The revenue over the past five years is now at a compound annual growth rate of 34%. This type of revenue growth is unreal. It's something that you almost never see in any company ever across the entire market. I've looked at hundreds of different charts in Qualtrum. I'm very familiar with normal patterns of growth and this is not normal. And it's not just revenue, we have the EBIT of the company. It looks equally silly. It's up 640% over the past year. In the past 10 years, it's a compound annual growth rate of 51%. The past five years, 40%. And the jump quarter over quarter is completely abnormal from 2.6 billion to 6.8 billion. Now we move on to look at their free cash flow, and this is what it looks like as well. It's over double the previous quarter, over double any other quarter in their entire history. So the company just randomly, one quarter to the next, over doubled in their cash flows. If we look at the stock based comp, this is going up steadily, but the free cash flow is far outpacing it. On a stock based comp adjusted free cash flow per share, which is the purest way to look at these cash flows, even adjusting for dilution and adjusting for share buybacks, the free cash flow on a per share basis is well over double any of the previous quarters. Here's the gap diluted earnings per share that quarter, $2.48 per share, compared to the previous quarter of 82 cents. So it tripled in a single quarter. It's up 853% year over year. Trying to break down how this happened is near impossible. Nvidia certainly got more revenue, but they also got higher returns on their revenue in a single quarter. If we go down and we look at the actual profitability ratios of the company, and we filter by return on capital employed, we can see that the ROCE of the company jumped to 28% in the last quarter. These types of leaps are abnormal for a company, but Nvidia was able to pull this off. Now, of course, these fundamental developments are not the only thing that's gone up for Nvidia. The price has also increased substantially this year. Year to date, it's up 220%. In the past five years, Nvidia is up 565% but it has not been without extreme volatility along the way. Now, if we look back on the reasons of why Nvidia was able to do this, how they're able to pull off this massive feat, it's a lot of strategic decisions from the management. Most of this success has been because of the management. Nvidia has been in the AI game for a decade now. The company began touting its CUDA programming language used by AI developers 
to investors as early as 2006, according to transcripts compiled by S&P Global Market Intelligence. That technology formed the foundation of a business to sell the graphic processors once used mainly in video games to data center operators seeking more advanced computing capabilities. NVIDIA's data center business crossed the $1 billion mark in annual revenues five years ago and recently surpassed the size of its video gaming business. Here's NVIDIA's data center revenue per quarter. Now, when I see these type of charts on Qualtrum, I feel like there's something wrong. I have to go back and check and see if my data provider got something wrong. In this case, it's correct. This last quarter there in red is the correct number. NVIDIA's business has basically doubled in size compared with the same quarter last year, and that is almost entirely a result of booming demand for the company's latest artificial intelligence chip, which are being snapped up by tech giants being generative AI services. So there we have the growth in the company. Did you catch that last sentence? Almost all of this growth, the company doubling in size over the past year, is booming demand for the company's latest artificial intelligence chip. As we've seen, everyone has become invested in AI. Everybody wants to own AI, especially the big tech companies. Well, they're the ones saying, hey, we got all the goods. We can sell this product that everyone needs. And they were able to get almost 100% of the demand for AI. One company snagged up all that demand. Now, when I look at NVIDIA, I'm in awe of their success. I think it's incredible what they've been able to accomplish, their strategic positioning, how they've been able to fulfill on this demand for AI, and how they've been able to tackle this entire market, taking it from AMD and Intel. It's really been staggering. It's just incredible to watch a company do this. But when I try to do analysis on whether or not this company is investable, I always come to the conclusion that this is in no way investable under my criteria, because it's lacking the main thing that I look for in a company, which is predictability. I don't think anyone was predicting the outcome that's happened over the past year. Not a single person knew that that was going to happen with NVIDIA. On top of that, NVIDIA has a history of having booming profits for a time and then a sharp fall off in profits later. And the stock price shows the same. We can look at the past 10 years of stock price performance for NVIDIA. Back in 2017, the stock rode up like crazy, and then it had a substantial drop. The same thing in 2019, we had a big boom, the stock went all the way up in 2021, and then it went down over 50%. We see likewise now another big boom upwards to $450 per share. But is this going to be a continual growth story? NVIDIA's earnings are highly unpredictable. Stock market participants cannot accurately predict over the next three years what is going to happen with this company. We look back in 2007, the company went from having positive growing earnings to negative, had multiple quarters of negative EPS. Now we have back in 2016, the same thing. We have booming earnings and then three quarters of earnings declining over 50%. We had the same thing as recent as 2021. The earnings climbed up quadruple and then dropped 60%. And then we have the most unpredictable earnings, but we have it going in a good direction. The earnings tripling in the past quarter. To a lot of people, this is exciting. It draws a lot of attention. It makes you want to own this company to not miss out. That's called FOMO. To me, this is an unattractive trait in a stock. So whether or not this company is highly overvalued, the most overvalued company in the market, or whether or not it's cheap, I don't believe anyone really knows the answer. I don't believe even the most intelligent analyst or investor could give you a straight answer on that. We even have Oswat Damodoran, the Dean of Valuation, known for his intelligence, his articulation, his great lectures on YouTube, and his ability to come up with valuations for any company. Here's what he says regarding NVIDIA's valuation. Now, my, my estimate is worth about 240 a share. He just said that his estimate of NVIDIA's fair value is $240 per share. NVIDIA currently trades at $456 per share. So the Dean evaluation is saying 240. That's his valuation. So NVIDIA is 100% overvalued, right? You want to stay far away from this company. But if we continue on with this interview, it's revealed that Aswath owns NVIDIA and he's not selling it. You're not selling all your NVIDIA stock, right? No. 
And I, th and I think that reflects the mixed feelings I have about the company. He's not selling all of his shares because he has mixed feelings about the company. When someone says that the stock they own is over double the valuation that they come up with as their fair value estimate, but they're still unwilling to sell, what this tells me is that people do not know how to value Nvidia. And it's anyone's best guess. That's really what investors are doing at this point. The company is massively massively unpredictable. And whether or not this type of trend of explosive growth will continue and Nvidia can continue to support their valuation is totally unknown, even by the best investors. So to be very clear, I am not bearish on Nvidia. I'm not bullish on Nvidia. I believe that Nvidia is highly unpredictable and that's the reason that I'm personally not invested in it. Now moving on, we have some news that I think was overlooked. This was a article posted a week back on the Wall Street Journal and it highlighted some efforts that Amazon's doing in the payment category. But it highlighted what Amazon's true ambitions are and how it could really change the world. This is in the form of payments. Now, I pay attention to payments because I have two companies that are heavily involved in payments. One of them is in the financial category here, which is MasterCard. Obviously, between the duopoly of MasterCard and Visa, they control a large segment of credit card processing. Another company that I own that's big into payments is Apple. Apple Pay is becoming ubiquitous and popular amongst every merchant. Most of the data shows that Apple Pay has gained substantial market share. Amazon, on the other hand, has been wanting to get in this market for a long period of time, but so far has been unsuccessful. And this attempt from them, I think, is their best effort. By the end of this year, you'll be able to scan your palm at any of the company's more than 500 Whole Foods stores in the U.S. and join a service called Amazon One. Once enrolled, your hand is all you need to pay there. So imagine that, you wanna go pick up some milk from the grocery store, you drive down to a Whole Foods, and you literally don't need anything but your palm to pay. That is the future with Amazon and even stores outside of the ones that they own. Amazon Fresh grocery stores, some Panera restaurants, a handful of retailers at airports, some stadiums and concert venues, and a handful of Starbucks locations. So really it's a small amount of locations and different stores doing this, but it's starting to spread. At places where the company's hand scanning sensors are installed, you can already use it and enter a value. Identify yourself as a member of a loyalty program or verify your age at a bar. In the future, you might be able to gain access to your company's offices, a parking garage or a gym, or sign in at a hospital or doctor's office. That's the big advantage that Amazon has here. And this is a major distinction. Visa and MasterCard allow you to pay for things. But to pay for it, first of all, you have to have the card number or the card itself. You have to have the security code. You have to have something physical on you. And you can't really use that for identification. Nobody's using their Visa card just to identify themselves. You use it to pay for something. With Amazon's Palm technology, Amazon One, they're going for something much broader, which is identification. Being able to use this to get into a parking garage or a gym, that is an entirely different use case. But the more that I was thinking about this, the more it makes sense. If you could link your palm identification to a payment account, but also your identification overall, I could see this being used for everything you do regarding ID. Of course, the obvious ones they mention here, going to the hospital or doctor's office. I could also see this being used to have your passport or driver's license. The use cases for having personal identification linked to your body is virtually endless. Amazon's expansion of this biometric technology, which it unveiled in 2020, is an effort to compete with Google and especially Apple in the realm of digital wallets, which are increasingly performing many of the same functions Amazon has in mind for its Amazon One service. The problem here is that Apple and Google already have a monopoly on the digital wallet. Nobody's gonna be able to take away the digital wallet from Apple. It's just impossible at this point. Everyone that has an iPhone is going to be using the Apple wallet. That's where they're gonna store all of their IDs. It's already commonplace. So what Amazon's doing here is trying to make the digital wallet completely unnecessary. They're already trying to make that thing that Apple has and Google has out of date. They say Amazon One represents something bigger than payments. It is Amazon's most ambitious attempt to become a full identity provider. I think a lot of people are gonna be reluctant to move to something where records tied to their palm or any part of their body. Even though the government does that already with fingerprints, it's a little bit more uh, almost invasive by big tech. It's something that I think people will be more reluctant to. So Apple's going the safer route with the digital wallet on your phone. That's the same route that Google's going. But if you really think about this, it makes sense over a given period of time that people will be okay just identifying themselves by their hand. 
by not having any physical product attached to them. So while I believe there could be a number of people very reluctant to participate in this type of identification, this does seem like the natural path of identification in the future. Something tied to either your eyes, your fingers, or your palm. In this case, Amazon is gone with the palm. Now we had some pretty big news in the food world. Subway Sandwich has been the largest chain that's been privately owned for a long period of time. And it was owned by the founders of Subway Sandwich. It was recently just purchased by an equity firm named Rourke Capital. Now we don't know the exact price of the bid, but we got some numbers that give us a good idea. We believe that Subway was sold for 9.6 billion. Texas Roadhouse right now is selling for $7 billion. So Subway actually is a bigger company or it's sold for more than Texas Roadhouse. Now the company that bought it owns Inspire Brands and that's a company that owns Duncan, Baskin Robbins, Sonic, Arby's, Buffalo Wild Wings, and Jimmy John's. Those are the main companies they own. None of those were as big as Subway. So this is a huge acquisition for them. This doesn't surprise me. I believe we're going to see continued consolidation in the restaurant category. I've gone over restaurants many times. I believe that they're becoming far more optimized. I own Texas Roadhouse and Chipotle, which I consider both of them to be incredibly resilient, wide moat, highly predictable businesses. So while they're restaurants and anyone can sell food, these companies in particular are very difficult to compete with. So the news of further consolidation should not be surprising. I expect to see a lot more of this in the future. Now moving on to Disney, we have more gloomy news from this company. It seems like all the magic has left it, and now we're getting the Yahoo Finance notifications that the company is down to a almost decade low. Looking at the stock price, Disney's down to where it was 10 years ago. And Disney's never paid a big dividend, so this is really almost no returns over the past 10 years. This is a really difficult situation. Disney has a complex business with many moving parts. The parts of it that are related to sports are under a tremendous amount of pressure by big tech. The other parts of the company, including their movie business, is now under big pressure by many competitors. The Barbie movie, for example, is doing billions of dollars in the box office while Disney continues to struggle. But with that said, I've noticed a trend in the market over the past five years. Typically when we see these type of gloomy headlines and the multi-decade low of a company, that in most cases is a decent time to own the company. Now, it could be different in the case of Disney if they're not able to figure out their business, if they're not able to return to good free cash flows and growing earnings, but if they are able to get back on track and to start growing earnings repeatedly year after year and start growing free cash flow repeatedly year after year, we could see this as towards the bottom of Disney. So if I was looking at this right now, I have no interest in jumping back in Disney. The company for me, again, lacks the predictability that I look for. But if I own the stock right now and I was in the red on it, I probably would not be selling today. I would continue to hold at this price because it's already so beat up. There's such a good opportunity to get some type of jump out of this, some type of good news. All Disney needs to have happen is something go their way. The next time something goes their way, the stock could jump back up into the 100s, into the 110s. So if I owned it right now, I would likely hold on to it. But if I got another opportunity to sell out of the company at 110, 115, I would take that opportunity. Now, you know what time it is. It's Friday, which means we look to TikTok for the best financial advice and life advice in general. And this individual here has something really special to share with us. My day is 6 a.m. to noon, and I'm not crazy. You're crazy for thinking it takes 24 hours, just like some dude in a cave did 300 years ago. My second day starts at noon and goes till 6 p.m. That's day two. And then the next day is 6 p.m. to midnight. Okay, so he just said that he has three days. Three days because one of them starts and then ends in the morning. One of them starts uh, in the afternoon and ends in the afternoon. And then one of them starts in the evening and ends in the late evening. Three days instead of one. Now, as I have changed and manipulated time, I now get 21 days a week. Stack that up over a month, I'm gonna kick your butt. Stack it up over a year, you're toast. Stack it up over five years, my entire life is different than it would have been otherwise. He's saying that he has three days in a day because he broke down a single day into three parts. And he's acting as though this is some miraculous type of, of unlock, some type of thing that he has found out that nobody else is doing. What he's discovered here, the marvelous invention, the thing that he's really unraveled is a daily schedule. 
That's what he's done. But instead of acting like he just uses a daily schedule and he breaks up his day into three parts, he's acting like he's Doctor Strange from the Avengers. What I've done now is I have changed a manipulated time. I now get 21 days a week. You haven't changed a manipulated time. You discovered a daily schedule. What I want to point out here is this common trend of someone doing something that's entirely ordinary, but then just rephrasing it and talking about it as though they discovered something new and revolutionary. This guy discovered what a calendar is and now he's talking about it like he's a wizard. So I apologize for the tip this time. Apparently it's just to use a daily schedule. Maybe we'll get better advice next time for TikTok. That's all for today. I'll see you in the next one.